welcome to Murder, She Drew. As this is my first video, I will give a brief intro. Murder, She Drew is taking true crime to a whole new level. As I talk about true crime cases or historical events that have caught my fancy, I will be creating a work of art either based around the chosen subject or just something artsy in general. I will leave a list of all the products that I use in the description below, just in case you feel like looking into that. Today's case is an unsolved true crime about the murder of Elizabeth Short, or better known as the Black Dahlia murder. I think a lot of people aren't fans of the unsolved true cases, but I thought it was interesting and the case still deserves to see the light although i do wish that you know the case had come to some sort of resolve because i mean everybody deserves some sort of justice so some people are interested in this and some people aren't but flowers have significant meanings different flowers have different meanings you know so i was curious as to why they chose a black dahlia of all flowers to describe her or this murder. And a black dahlia, which is actually a deep burgundy color, conveys negative meanings compared to the other shades of the flower. And since they have the strongest hue of all dahlias, they often symbolize betrayal, sadness, and other negative emotions, which I thought was quite interesting considering the situation. Um, I want to give a brief content warning for graphic descriptions of the murder. It is pretty disturbing. I read it and it made me cringe. Alright, so let's begin. In the archives of unsolved cases in America, very, very few have cast a spell quite like the Black Dahlia murder. Even though many, many decades have passed since the newspaper first published the brutal crime titled L.A. Girl Slain, Body Slashed in Two, and Body Dismembered, Left in Field, this case still rem remains just as mystifying as ever. It's one of those that leaves you with more questions than answers, and this murder has had lasting cultural intrigue. It's become the base of movies, books, and even video games. There's a game called L.A. Noir that has a level inspired by this murder. I looked it up because I was curious, but it costs $39 to purchase it, and I am not going to spend that kind of money on a game, at least not right now. But if you yourself are curious about it and want to go play it, then it is on Xbox and other things I'm sure. So it's also noted as one of the most famous unsolved murders in American history, which is crazy, maybe not, because I listen to true crime quite a lot and I don't think I've ever stumbled across this case. And maybe I have and I just don't remember, but as far as I know, I haven't. But, I mean, they say it's one of the most infamous unsolved cases in America, so we'll believe it. Now we're going to talk about Elizabeth's childhood, or what I could find of it. Elizabeth was born on July 29th in 1924 in the Hyde Park area of Boston, Massachusetts. She was the third of five daughters born to Cleo Alvin Short and Phoebe May Sawyer. In 1927, the family relocated to Portland, Maine, but ended up moving to Medford, which is a suburb of Boston. So, essentially, they moved right back to where they started out. But, like they say, there's no place like home. At that time, Cleo had built several miniature golf courses, but ended up losing all his money when the stock market crashed in 1929, which marked the beginning of the Great Depression. 
The next year, in 1930, Cleo's car was found on a bridge, abandoned, on the Charlestown Bridge. Many people assumed that he had jumped into the river, and since that everyone assumed that Cleo was dead, the responsibility for providing for five daughters fell solely upon the shoulders of Phoebe. She ended up getting a job as a bookkeeper to try and support her family. Now, of the research that I've done, I don't know if anybody found Cleo's body or if they just assumed that he drowned or, you know, jumped or if, you know, I don't know if there was ever a search party conducted or anything like that or if they just, you know, oh, well, he's dead. End of that. Of all the articles I read and all the research I did, there's very little on Elizabeth's father. So I don't really know um, what happened to him or why people assume that he was dead or why he did what he did. You know, there's really nothing there to indicate it. But anyway. When Elizabeth was young, she was plagued with bronchitis and had severe asthma attacks. At the age of 15, she went, she underwent lung surgery, and her doctors thought it would be beneficial to, quote, periodically move to milder climates to prevent further respiratory problems. So, for the next three winters, or the next three years, uh, Phoebe sent her daughter to Miami, Florida, to live with friends and family. And at the time, Elizabeth was attending Medford High School, but when she was only a sophomore, she ended up dropping out. I'm not sure why she dropped out, but she dropped out. So there's not much really known as to why, but she did. Jumping forward a few years, we are now in the late 1942, and Elizabeth's mother receives a letter, an apology letter, from a dead Cleo, which means he wasn't actually dead. He was very much alive, which I would be kind of irritated at this point, you know, if he just popped up out of nowhere and was like, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, I just, I didn't feel like being here anymore. So I left without a word. I hope you guys weren't too worried. But in this letter, he stated that he had started a new life in California. And I really want to know, like, I know it's common enough for a parent to walk out on their family. But I'm, I'm curious as to why he chose to do that. Like, what happened? Was there family problems, like marriage problems? Or something like that? Or did he just not want to be there anymore? Like, what's the reason? You know, I don't know. But regardless, I think it was wrong. In December of that same year, 1942, Elizabeth moved to Vallejo, California at the age of 18 and she was going to live with her father, whom she had not seen since she was six. If it was me, I wouldn't do that just because I feel really uncomfortable, you know, just being like, oh yeah, hey pops, what's up? I haven't seen you in years, but can I live with you? You know, I mean, each their own, but still, don't know. At the time that Elizabeth moved out there, her father was working at the Mare Island Naval Shipyard in the San Francisco Bay. But by January of 1943, not even a month after moving out there, Elizabeth moved out on her own. She didn't want to be with Dad anymore. 
she moved out due to the arguments that she was having with her father. I don't know, again, no research says anything, but I don't know if there was abuse going on or if it was, you know, strictly just like we're not getting along. So, you know, I don't want to be here anymore, you know, that kind of a thing. But regardless, she moved out on her own. And after she moved out, she got a job at a base exchange at Camp Cook, which is now known as Vandenberg Air Force Base, located near Lompoc, California. Fun fact, Lompoc is actually where I was born, in case you were wondering. And while she worked here, she briefly lived with a U.S. Army Air Force sergeant, and reportedly he was abusive. In mid-1943, she left Lompoc and moved to Santa Barbara. On the 23rd of September, 1943, she was arrested due to underage drinking at a bar. The authorities ended up sending her back to Massachusetts. I'm not sure why they sent her back to Massachusetts, because she was 18, and now this is 1943. I don't know if there was, like... If a legal age is different than it is now, like, because at 18, you're a legal adult. 21, you're legally allowed to drink. Um, and I don't know if it was different back then, if 18 wasn't actually the legal age or not. I'm not sure. But, however, they did send her back to Massachusetts. But pretty much right away, she moved back to Florida and very rarely visited her family back in Boston. I think it's weird, you know, it's your family, you don't want to go see them. But, I mean, she could have had a not great relationship with them, I'm not sure. While she was living in Florida, she met a man named Matthew Michael Gordon Jr., which is quite the name. And he was a decorated major of the Army Air Force of the 2nd Air Commando Group. And at this time, they were training for deployment to the Southeast Asia Theater of World War II. At some point later, Elizabeth actually told her friends that he had proposed, Matthew had proposed marriage while he was recovering from a plane crash in India. She accepted his offer, but sadly there would be no wedding because he died on August 10th, 1945, only a week before the war ended. And finally, in July of 1946, she relocated yet again, this time to Los Angeles to visit another military man she had met in Florida. His name was Joseph Gordon Fickling, and he was an Army Air Force tenant. She really had a thing going for these military men. She really did. But anyway. For the last six months of her life, she lived in L.A. and worked as a waitress to support herself. She was went. She was renting a room behind the Florentine Gardens nightclub on Hollywood Boulevard. A lot of people said that she had aspirations to become a movie star, but obviously nothing came out of it, and... I don't know if she really did or not, but she might have. You know, I mean, you're living in Hollywood. Who wouldn't want to be an actress? I mean, it is pretty cool. Um, and now, on January 9th, 1947, Elizabeth returned home 
with a man returned home to L.A. with a man named Robert Manley. And he was a 25-year-old married salesman that she had been dating. And I want to say that this just just knowing this, it's not a good idea to get involved with married people, like, ever. Because, I mean, who knows what this caused, you know? I mean, I hope nothing, you know? I hope he wasn't involved or anything like that. But you never know. You never do know. So, word of advice. Just stay away from married men, please. There are plenty of single men out there, I'm sure. But Manley said that he had dropped Beth off at the Biltmore Hotel. And Beth was supposed to meet her sister, who was visiting from Boston that afternoon. By some accounts, the staff of the Biltmore remembered seeing Beth use the lobby telephone. And shortly after, some said that she'd been seen by people at the Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge, about three-eighths of a mile away from the Biltmore. And she had been missing since January 9th, since that day that Robert Manley had dropped her off at the Biltmore. And her whereabouts during this missing week remain a mystery. But a lot of people think that this week contains the key to her death, which it seems like it would, you know, I mean, where was she? And here, it definitely poses a lot of questions that I have, you know, is like, she used the lobby telephone, then she left. Where was she going? Who did she call, you know? Um, Did she ever meet up with her sister? Was she really supposed to meet her sister? Or was that just something that Robert Manley said to, you know, I don't know throw the suspicion off him if he was ever a suspect, which I don't think he was. But obviously he got questioned. Um, Robert was definitely the last one to see her alive for sure. Like, he was with her. He dropped her off. You know, and then it's just like, where did she go after that? You know, everybody wants to know, like, what in the world happened to this girl? You know? But anyway. I think it's really sad that no one knows what happened to her. Like, did she not have friends that would be concerned about her if she didn't show up? She was working as a waitress, so they didn't say anything when she didn't show up for work, you know? Did someone plan it out where she'd taken a week off work and no one would have known she was missing? Or, like... Just explain it to me. I want to know exactly, like, what's going on here. Like, what happened. I think we all do, but... To think that what she went through, she must have been terrified, you know. And it's it's just heartbreaking, really. So here we come to the murder. A very sad day. On the morning of January 15th, 1947, around 10 a.m., a local housewife named Betty Bursinger was walking with her three-year-old daughter down Norton Avenue in L.A. when she saw something disturbing in an empty lot. on the west side of South Norton Avenue, midway between Coliseum Street and West 39th Street in the neighborhood of Lemur Park. When she first saw the corpse, Bersinger said that the body was so white that first she assumed it was a mannequin. But when she realized that what she was really looking at was a severed corpse, she ran to a nearby house where she proceeded to call authorities. The body that Bersinger found was that of 22-year-old Elizabeth Short, also known now as the Black Dahlia.
And here we get to the details of the crime scene. So yeah, it does get a little graphic, a little gory. Just, just a heads up. So, she had been severely mutilated, but there was no blood anywhere to be seen with the body. Which would suggest that the body had been thoroughly cleaned before being placed there on Norton Avenue. I think this was also suggest that the actual murder took place somewhere else too. I mean, obviously, if I just stated the obvious, obviously. But, um, because with this kind of mutilation, there would definitely be a whole lot of blood. And another thing is, you know, I mean, I'm not a serial killer. I wouldn't know for sure, you know? But of the true crime cases that I have watched or listened to, you know, a lot of killers do try to hide the body or dispose of the body. Some don't. Some just kill and leave it where they found it or where the crime took place, you know. And some, they do, you know, try to hide the body. Um... But specifically this being that the body was placed on a heavily trafficked street, like street side, you know, right near a sidewalk where someone would find it for sure, without a doubt. You know, it was very obviously that, it was very obvious that they wanted someone to find her pretty quickly. And I mean, it, it was just terrible to think, you know, that, I mean, this little girl probably saw a dead body and it was just like, really? Like, that's terrible. It's just kind of disrespectful. I mean, either way, it's disrespectful. But near her body, detectives found a heel print. And a cement sack with traces of blood that presumably had been used to transport the body. To the vacant lot in Lemur Park. Medical examiners determined that she had been dead for about 10 hours prior to the discovery, which would leave her time of death either sometime during the evening of the previous day, January 14th, or early morning hours of January 15th, the day they found her body, the day she was murdered. Um, and here we get into the gory stuff. She had several cuts on her thigh and breasts where entire Portions of flesh had been sliced away. The lower half of her body was positioned about a foot away from the upper and her intestines had been tucked neatly beneath her butt. The corpse had been posed with her hands over her head, her elbows bent at right angles and her legs spread apart. And her face was slit ear to ear in a maniacal joker face rictus or also known as the Glasgow smile. And according to one source that I read, it said that her stomach was full of feces, leading some to believe that she had been forced to eat them before she was killed. Now, of all the articles I read, only one of them said that, so I don't know if it's accurate or not. But I just put that in there because I thought that was really horrible just to add on top of everything else that happened to her. That too. Um, the marks on her body were suggestive that she had been bound and tortured. The autopsy confirmed that she had died of cerebral hemorrhaging, 
which if you don't know what cerebral hemorrhaging is, it's bleeding that occurs around or within the brain tissue. And in this case, it would have caused would have been caused by trauma to the head, suggesting that she was, you know, hit in the head. And I'm inserting this, the entire quote, because I think it's key to this story, and I wanted to make sure to get all these details in there. So this is a quote, which is from the report from the coroner. And it said, an autopsy of Short's body was performed on January 16th, 1947 by Frederick Newbar, the Los Angeles County coroner. Newbar's autopsy report stated that Short was 5 feet, 5 inches tall, weighed 115 pounds, and had light blue eyes, brown hair, and badly decayed teeth. There were lig ligature marks on her ankles, wrists, and neck, and irregular laceration with superficial tissue loss um, on her right breast. Newbar also noted superficial lacerations on the right forearm, left upper arm, and the lower left side of the chest. The body had been cut completely in half by a technique taught in the 1930s called a hemicorporectomy. That word is so hard to say. I've been practicing... And a hemocorporectomy is a radical surgery in which the body below the waist is amputated, transecting the lumbar spine. This removes the legs, the genitalia, both internal and external, the urinary system, pelvic bones, anus, and the rectum. The lower half of her body had been removed by transecting the lumbar spine between the second and third lumbar vertebrae, thus severing the intestine at the duodenum. Newbar's report Newbar's report noted very little bruising along the incision line, suggesting it had been performed after death. Another gaping laceration measuring four and one-fourth inches in length ran longitudinally from the umbilicus to the suprapubic region, which I think is from the belly button down to, you know, your nether regions. The lacerations on each side of the face, which extended from the corners, of the lips were measured at three inches on the right side of the face and two and a half inches on the left. The skull was not fractured, but there was bruising noted on the front and right side of her scalp with a small amount of bleeding in the subcarinoid space on the right side, consistent with blows to the head. Also, if I'm mispronouncing these words, I'm sorry. You know, I'm trying my best, but these are big words. The cause of death was determined to be hemorrhaging from the lacerations to her face and the shock from blows to the head and face. Newbar noted that the that Short's anal canal was dilated at one and three fourths inches, suggesting that she might have been raped. Samples were taken from her body, testing for the presence of semen, but the results came back negative. Short was identified after her fingerprints were sent to the FBI via sound photo which is a device that transmits images by telephone and was normally used for news photographs. Short's fingerprints were on file from her 1943 arrest, and immediately following Short's identification, reporters from William Randolph Hearst's Los Angeles Examiner contacted her mother. Phoebe Short, in Boston, and told her that her daughter had won a beauty contest. And it was only after prying as much personal information as they could from Phoebe that the reporters revealed that her daughter had, in fact, been murdered. The newspapers offered to pay her airfare and accommodations if she would travel to Los Angeles to help with the police investigation. But that was another lie because the newspaper didn't allow Phoebe anywhere near the crime scene or other reporters to protect its scoop. Which I still think is terrible because, I mean, this is someone's life. You know, you can't mess with someone's 
a life like that. This is a human being we're talking about that was just, you know, brutally murdered. But anyway. The Examiner and other Hearst newspaper and another Hearst newspaper, the Los Angeles Herald Express, later sensationalized the case, describing the black tailored suit. Short was last seen wearing as a tight skirt and a sheer blouse. And the media nicknamed her the Black Dahlia. And described her as an adventuress who prowled Hollywood Boulevard. Additional newspaper reports, such as one um, published in the Los Angeles Times on January 17th, deemed the murder a sex fiend slain. I don't know if she was involved with anything like that, you know, because, I mean, it doesn't say. The media will say one thing, you know, her family could say another, the police would say another, so I don't know, you know, what to think. But I think either way, you know, it's still a shame that she got murdered. I don't really care what her job was. Whether she was working as a call girl or not, you know, her life still matters. But the media also dubbed Beth as the Black Dahlia due to her jet black hair. So there are a few different reasons that they called her the Black Dahlia. You know, pick one reason and, you know, go with it, I guess. Um, the nickname Black Dahlia also spoke to the media's two-faced presentation of Beth. On one hand, she was portrayed as this innocent girl lost in a big city, you know, murdered by predators who took advantage of her innocence. And yet, in another breath, many journalists, many journalists insinuated that Elizabeth had been working as a call girl. And the barely concealed subtext was that a sex worker had been burned in her line of work. The death was unfortunate, but maybe yet to be expected, which I think is so, like, uncaring, unsympathetic, uh, just downright cold. When you really think about it like that. But... With all that being said, the Los Angeles District Attorney determined that Beth had never actually worked as a call girl um, or an escort. Now, I don't know if this is because they were able to call agencies that, you know, what do you call it, hired these women and didn't get anything or, you know, how they came to the conclusion one way or the other. Uh, on the 24th of January, 1947, a suspicious manila envelope addressed to the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers was discovered. The envelope included a, leather, a letter using cutout words from newspaper clippings that said, Here is Dahlia's belongings. And also inside were Elizabeth's birth certificate, photographs, business cards, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book. Um, <clears throat> everything in that envelope had been cleaned with gasoline, which was quite similar to how 
the body had been cleaned. So they came to the conclusion that this letter had to have been sent by Elizabeth's killer. Which makes sense. Makes sense. Um, this, sorry I said that, but about 70 min, 75 men from her address book were contacted, but most of them claim to have only known her for a very short time. But when does that stop someone from killing? You know, oh no, I only knew her for like five hours. Well, yeah, but you know, you can still kill her for some reason. But anyway, um, due to the nature of the cuts that she had sustained, they also believe that the killer had to be someone who had medical knowledge since the way that she was cut, like dissected, was a medical um, thing that they used to perform, which I don't know why anybody would do that to someone. Like, what's the purpose of that? Like, does it help with something? I don't know. But, you know, they came to the conclusion that the person must have had medical knowledge. So they served a warrant to the USC Medical School, which is University of Southern California, which was actually located very close to where Elizabeth's body had been found. And about 60 people came forward and confessed to the crime. But of these 60, only 25 the police actually considered. Which I think it's weird that so many people came forward and confessed. Like, is that a normal thing with murders? Or was it just in this case that people thought it'd be cool? Hey, you don't want to kill her. I don't want credit for that, you know. Like, I have no idea. But... Um, many of these suspects were well-known household names, such as Fred Sexton, who was an artist that created the Maltese Falcon prop in the iconic movie of the same name. And then we have Norman Chandler, who was the publisher of the Los Angeles Times. We have Bugsy Siegel, who was a Jewish mobster. And George Hodel, a physician who purchased the Souden house and, according to Hodel's son, buried bodies in the backyard. Now, I don't know if they found bodies in the backyard or not, you know, at some point later in time, you know, or what happened with that, you know? Um, but... Out of those, no convictions were ever made. And I don't know if they just didn't have enough evidence or if they just determined that they were all just lying. You know, but it's it's so crazy. Um and then to wrap up this case, on February second, nineteen forty seven, just two weeks after Short's murder. Uh, Republican State Assemblyman C. Don Field was prompted by the case to introduce a bill calling for the formation of a sex offender registry. And the state of California would become the first U.S. state to make the registration of sex offenders mandatory, which is great. You know, I mean, people who have been charged with, you know, sex crimes and have to register for you know, be put on the sex offenders list, don't like it. But for people like Beth, who may have been the victim of such, you know, it was, it was a good thing.
about it too. Anyway, Schwartz's murder has been described as one of the most brutal and culturally enduring crimes in American history. And Time Magazine listed it as one of the most infamous unsolved cases in the world. In the world. And again, I'm surprised that I had not heard of this until I stumbled across it looking for a case to do. It was interesting. It was very sad. Um, so that's the end of this case. I still wish I could end it with the name of a killer and put this to rest. But I can't. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel for new content every week. Also, feel free to leave comments down below with your thoughts on this case or suggestions for future stories to feature. Until next time, bye!